Regardless of what sport is being played and the movement being performed, the sequence of movements being undertaken all follow their own biomechanical principles. In accordance with the Australian Institute of Sport, the term biomechanics can be defined as examining the forces which are acting on the body and the effects of these forces. The importance behind these biomechanics is that the more we understand about our sequence of movement and the forces that can be generated by the body, the better a technique can be improved to maximise both the output and effectiveness of a sporting action. The aim of this presentation will be to focus on and analyse the sporting action in a biomechanical format and explaining both the good and bad aspects which can be associated with this action. For this presentation, the sporting action that will be focused on is that of the rugby union conversion kick. A conversion kick is a highly important skill in the game of rugby and can quite often be a determining factor for whether a team walks away with a victory at the end of a match. A conversion kick is taken by one individual player as a result of either a try being scored or a penalty being awarded and is taken from varying angles and distances on the field. The kicker of a conversion can place the ball on either sand, sawdust or a kicking tee which is directly on the ground. For the kick to be successful, the player must be able to complete a sequence of movements to execute a clean strike of the ball, including run-up, planting of the land foot and leg swing combined with ball contact. The conjunction of all these aspects of the rugby conversion, along with knowledge of biomechanical principles, is what will be able to make the difference between failure and success. To understand the important aspects and just what it takes for a rugby conversion to be deemed successful, we must break it down into each of its individual segments. This breaking down of the movement pattern is what is referred to as performance criterion. The term performance criterion can be defined as the standards by which performance is evaluated. Performance criteria helps coaches maintain objectivity and inform athletes about expectations, giving them a target or goal for which to strive. As we can see through the performance criteria designed for the rugby conversion, the movement starts from the point in time where the ball is placed upon the tee through to when the ball is kicked by the player. The criterion includes all aspects of the kick, including the initial alignment of the feet, establishing of a kicking position at the back of the kicker's mark, the backswing and kicking phases, as well as the flexions and extensions through the hip, knee and ankle joints. Each of these aspects of the kick are highly important to execute correctly as they all work in correlation with each other to execute a well-performed kick. When making the assessment of the biomechanics involved in a rugby conversion, there is obviously one aspect which stands out as being the most important. This aspect is the ball being able to leave its place on the kicking tee and be projected towards the goalposts. To understand just how this happens, we must look at the application of Newton's first law of motion. The first law of motion states, Every object persists in its state of rest or uniform motion in a straight line unless it is compelled to change that state by forces impressed on it. To apply this law to the rugby conversion, this law states that the ball will remain in its still state on the tee until a force is acted upon it by the kicking foot. The determining factor for how far the ball will be able to travel off the tee will be directly related to the amount of force which can be generated by the kicker and transferred through the ball. This therefore means that Newton's second law of motion will also come into play when executing a good strike onto the ball to generate distance. Newton's second law states that force is equal to the change in momentum per change in time. For a constant mass, force equals mass times acceleration. For the example of our rugby kicker in this scenario, we can calculate the force which is generated independently by the kicking leg. Using the mean segment weights, which state that the total leg weight will equal 16.68% of total body mass in males, we can determine that by the subject's total body weight of 114 kilograms, the mass of the kicking leg will be equivalent to 19.02 kilos. With the acceleration of the leg from the peak of the swing being calculated as having a displacement of 1.2 meters from the point of impact and a swing speed from this point until first contact initiated on the ball as 0.08 seconds, 
we can determine a leg velocity of 15 meters per second and acceleration of 187.5 meters per second squared. To put these values into Newton's second law of motion, we can determine that by multiplying the leg weight of 19.02 kilograms by the acceleration of 187.5 meters per second squared, the kicking leg will be producing 3,566.25 newtons of energy upon point of impact with the ball. Upon knowing the amount of energy which is produced through the kicking leg, it is now possible for us to compare this with the velocity which the ball then possesses as it leaves its place on the tee. By gathering the information that the ball's change in displacement was 3.02 meters over a time period of 0.13 seconds, we can calculate that the ball possessed a velocity of 23.23 meters per second, an increase of 8.3 meters per second when compared to the velocity of the leg. This increased velocity is due to the transfer of force from the leg into the ball, where it then leaves its state of rest. We can then find that the acceleration of the ball calculated to be 178.69 meters per second squared, meaning that there was a decrease of 8.81 meters per second squared when compared to the acceleration of the leg swing. These findings show us that the energy transmitted through the leg and into the ball caused quite a spike in the velocity of the ball, which is fully what we expect to happen as the forces pass between the two. The final velocity of the ball can then be found using the formula initial velocity squared plus two times acceleration times displacement. Through the use of this formula, we can see that the final velocity of the ball through the air will be 32.85 meters per second squared, showing that the velocity does increase further than the initial three meters shown in the footage. Since we now know the different amounts of energy present between both the leg and the ball, we need to understand the ball's movement. By the force of the kicking leg being put into the ball itself, Newton's first law states that the object at rest will change its state. In the case of the ball off the tee, it will be turned into a projectile and moved through the air toward the goalposts. Once the ball is in the air, it is classified as being a projectile, where the only force that will be acting upon it is the force of gravity. This concept is what is known as projectile motion. Projectile motion will mean that once the ball has been struck and left the tee, the ball will travel along a parabola before it falls back to the ground due to gravity. The general rule of thumb is that the optimal angle for a projectile to be launched is at 45 degrees with a maximum velocity, although it has been found that this is not necessarily the case for kicking a rugby conversion. A study conducted by Linthorne and Stokes measured the optimum projection angle across 49 maximal effort kicks at various projection angle between 20 and 50 degrees. The study found that over the series of kicks, the projection angle which provided the best result in terms of distance was 30 degrees. This slightly lower projection angle is present due to the amount of velocity which is placed upon the ball. Because a kicker can place such high levels of velocity through the ball, the projection angle does not need to be higher to go further. We can see that the kicker in the footage has a projection angle of 26 degrees, which although is slightly lower than an elite level kicker, is quite close to being on the mark. This small variance in projection angle could easily be altered by the kicker through improving the point of contact on the foot, as the ball contact is closer towards the toe region, where it has been stated that it should be closer towards the instep. Upon knowing the various velocities, accelerations and amount of force, we as biomechanists can assess what aspects of the technique are providing positive or negative effects to the overall action. We will start from the top of the chain at the hip joint. Here we can see that the kicker displays a hip extension of 190 degrees at its greatest point of the backswing motion. This small increase in hip extension is quite good when considering the directions in which the hip joints move with it only possessing a small range of motion in the extension phase. The hip then reaches a flexion with the angle being 142 degrees, meaning there is a 48 degree range of motion through the entirety of the kick to the point of ball contact. The knee experiences a lot more movement than the hip due to the lower portion of the leg having to travel faster over a greater distance than the upper portion, since it is the segment where the kicking energy is transmitted. 
The knee joint undergoes a great deal of flexion in the backswing of the kick, with the greatest flexion being measured as 58 degree angle of the knee joint. The knee then holds this position for a moment of time before swinging through the kicking motion, with the knee being extended to 138 degrees at the point of contact with the ball, a difference of 80 degrees. This is considerably more than the hip movement, which goes to prove the importance that swinging of the lower leg plays while kicking. The final aspect of the kicking motion is the plantar flexion of the foot and ankle at the point of contact with the ball. The ankle and foot do not play a great role in the backswing, but are important in the contact phase to transfer the energy that has been generated. The foot was found to have been plantar flexed with an angle of 129 degrees, which, similar to the hip extension, is good when put into relation with the joint's level of flexibility.